Well, Goran Hayden Fishy, let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. I don't know how I got into this. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time you've appeared before me, and you must be very nervous. At least we ain't dead, Aaron. I don't feel well. A couple, couple of things I'd like to say as a preamble. The way we've set the evening up goes something like this. I'm going to warble on about the history of fishing in Garn Haven for a bit. And um, I've got to make um, a sort of apology from the start, because I've realised only to get today that I've gathered too much material. Uh, so I've got to think my way through summarising it as I go along. The other disclaimer is that I am not an expert. If you want experts, you have to get the likes of Dr. James Wetter, who has written the most erudite history um, of Goran Hayden in two volumes, which I think is still available. And uh, I'd also, I think, like to say that if I was going to dedicate an evening like this to anybody, it would be the late Archie Smith, yeah, yeah, yeah. who did so much for the history, the culture, and the well-being of this community. So, to fishing. Now, um, if you look at the poster, you may have got the idea that we're going to be talking about two old farmers fishing in a haystack. <laughs> that is not the case. We're going into fishing from the wet stuff down below, and uh, even though I've got to summarise as I go along, we might as well start at the beginning. <clears throat> we know from the research, researchers of various erudite individuals that these parts have been inhabited in one manner or another for about 8,000 years, probably longer, but uh, we have fragmentary evidence from 8,000 years ago. So we're going from the Stone Age into the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age. And there are bits and pieces, Chapel Point, Glarus, uh, which are remnants from those early days. Now, why would I be talking about that? Because it's the subject of another evening, I think. Well, the reason I mention it is simply because those early peoples had to eat. And where were they going to gain their sustenance? Well, it was either going to be from the land or from the sea. And with real certainty, we can say that with seas no doubt teeming with fish, that those early peoples, those prehistoric peoples, absolutely certainly gathered some of their sustenance from the sea. Uh, in earlier times, we can imagine people walking around the seashore, scavenging off the rocks for mussels and limpets, which you can still get if you want. Well, not very good, but you can still get them. Um, looking in rock pools, fishing out small crabs, and so on and so forth. Um, it would be wrong to get the idea that Bronze Age people, Iron Age people were primitives. Um, they were as sophisticated, if you like, as their as the technology that they had allowed them to be. So we're not talking about Hollywood sort of hairy people going around the place going ugh ugh and uh, it was a little bit more sophisticated than that I would guess. Um, <clears throat> but what we I think are going to be more interested in is that when the time came that there were settlements. In many of the farms in the area certainly go back to um, late prehistoric times probably, and when we move from the hunter-gatherer era into a slightly more sophisticated era, then long before the birth of Christ, we can assume uh, that people fished from boats, that they had equipment of some kind, that rudimentary tackle was developed, and that's very significant for Goran Haven, for the birth of Goran Haven in a sense. Because simple hunter-gatherers could have lived anywhere, inland, on old um, settlements, uh, which are still probably farmsteads, many of them. Uh, but when you actually start gathering equipment together, then you need a base. And when you've got boats, which um, my guess would be would certainly be happening at the very latest in the last thousand years BC, when you've got boats, you have to have shelter, you have to have somewhere to put them. Um, and uh, Goran Haven, then, as now, 
would have been protected by the huge promontory of the Dogman, and this cove here, whatever shape it took, would no doubt have been sanctuary in very early times. Uh, we know even that the Romans, or at least people infected by Roman culture, were, were in these parts because hordes of coins have been found, and there was probably a Roman signal station of some kind up on Chapel Point um, involved with uh, maritime traffic. Uh, <clears throat> Once you have a settlement, you have something very, very different. You have the birth of a place. And um, in order to consolidate that, I want to move into the early years AD and talk for a moment about that mythical, semi-mythical, or actual personage, Saint Just after whom our present 15th century church, well, it's dedicated to him. Now, St. Just allegedly came here in the 5th, 6th century, somewhere thereabouts. And it's taken, I think, by most have written on the subject, that before our present church was built in 14-something, uh, that there were other chapels there, a succession of oratories or chapels or whatever, and that St. Just, who possibly came from, our, um, sorry, from Wales, set up an oratory or a small chapel there. Now, the significance of that is when these saintly figures, like St. Piran, uh, St. Gurin, or St. Gorin as we know him, and St. Just came to these parts to spread their message, they had to have someone to spread it to. So the strong suggestion is therefore that there was a settlement here. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's the really one of the first absolutely central clues to the fact that there was a fishing community here in the period that we would call the Dark Ages, that is after the fall of the Roman Empire and up to the um, beginning of the medieval period. I'm just going to dwell on a couple of things a minute, just for amusement. Um, going back into prehistory again for a moment, we know for sure that sea levels in prehistory, perhaps we can go back to the Bronze Age three and a half thousand years ago. No, yes, that's right, two, three, yeah, three and a half thousand years ago. Um, the sea levels were much lower. One of the reasons we know this is that round at Port Mellon, on a very, very low tide, when the sand is drawn out, as it sometimes is, you can see the roots, fossilised roots of woodland around there. All of which tells us, without doubt, that the seashore was much further out. What applied in Port Mellon would no doubt have applied here. So we can imagine a rather different place in those times. If we look out of these windows in, uh, let's say, 4000 BC, we would expect probably to see a wooded valley going down much further than the present seashore, beyond the present seashore, and then perhaps the woodland gave away to the kind of scrub which could survive um, the onslaught of the easterly winds. Um, and with the sea level much lower, the Gwinnies was presumably a sizable island, probably with vegetation. Some have speculated that it might even have been inhabited. But notwithstanding all of that, the shelter, which is implied by the Dogman Point, would have still been the case. And so whatever the shape of the harbour is, um, everything that I've said so far still pertains. Um, it's, ju it's just interesting to picture how it might have looked. The river, or the stream, um, might have meandered down this valley, overhung by branches, and gone into the sea much further out. We know that Rice Farm, the word rice is a corruption of the Cornish for a ford, and so it's probable that a river was forded at rice. That's what it means. It's got nothing to do with those little stuff you get, bits of stuff you get with the Chinese that you get. <laughs> <in the evening. laughs> 
Now, it's just, here's another interesting point that I mentioned in passing. I suspect most people here know that Gower and Haven used to be called Porth East. Mm. And I think possibly for hundreds of years, because the original derivation got lost, people thought that Porth East meant the bay facing east. Well, that is almost certainly not the case. And the reason is... Um, pertaining to St. Just again. Now, just in Latin, the Y would have been soft and pronounced used, or perhaps even Eustus. Uh, but if we take it as used, we then um, have to uh, take into consideration the fact that the Cornish U is pronounced like an I. So to the Cornish-speaking peoples of these parts, he would have been... I don't know what the Cornish word for saint is, somebody will tell me, but he would have been Saint East, meaning just. So, far from being a place which was called Porth East because it faces east, it would have been called the equivalent of Porth Just, or the Cove of Saint Just. And that is what gives us a clue to settlement here at that time. But really, to get onto this properly, we need to come to the period of documented history. And a salient date in the whole business is the year 1270. 1270, let's put it into context. Henry III was on the throne of England. He just started building Westminster Abbey. Um, all the aristocracy, um, including his lords and uh, serfs and all the rest of it, who occupied these parts and owned the lands, like, for example, the Bedruggan family and later on the Mount Edgecombs, um, they all spoke French. French was the language of the aristocracy, partly due to the fact that um, England still owned massive tracts of France. Um, and continental travel was, you know, really continuous. But down here we spoke Cornish. And that prevailed up to the 17th century at least. I realise I'm hopping forward in time, um, but in around those times, 17th and 18th century, we know that Cornish was still spoken here, because on occasions when official business had to be carried out, and um, the upper strata, by then speaking English, uh, came into the place to adjudicate on legal matters, they had to bring in interpreters, because the fishermen of Gar and Haven still spoke in the rude, vulgar tongue. <laughs> Uh, so that much we do know. No change there. <laughs> Something I did mention, if anybody spots that I've... Uh, should have mentioned, if anybody spots that I've got anything wrong or I'm totally inaccurate, and they wish to, to announce the fact, then it's a kind of pass the parcel evening, and that person then takes over from me. <laughs> 